Welcome to Friday Flip Day number four. We'll be meeting in the STEM foyer um, tomorrow or Friday whenever you're watching this vodcast. Um, please remember to uh, come ready to draw because we're going to bust out our multicolored pens again um, and make some great drawings of metabolic pathways. In the interim, if you'd like to work with your poster group to revise your hypotheses, do let me know when you've uploaded an edited version just so that I will be aware that you're ready for me to um, take another look and to hopefully um, see that everything is satisfactory in all of those rubric categories. That will free you to move on, which means that you can work to write a full introduction within your poster shell and begin that growth of what will become a more and more well-developed poster. Homework 5 is next week, but I am going to offer you the opportunity to postpone the due date. I know that that's a short turnaround time because we did postpone the due date for homework number 4. And additionally, we're going into spring break, so it makes a lot of sense to allow ourselves enough time to finish that off. So simply let me know how you would like to change the due date, maybe until Thursday for that homework as well. I will hold my Monday night 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. office hours as usual on YO courses. However, I will adjust my other office hours for the week of nationals, and I will make announcements on YO courses um, related to those changes in date. I promise that I will have plenty of office hours to enable you to get through the homework and to feel very comfortable with the material that um, we have talked about. That being said, let's go ahead and jump in for the day. I've um, used a yeast cell as my organism, my model organism, to make uh, a, a very nice um, view or look at all of glycolysis. At this point, that's the only pathway that we've learned is the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. So on this view, you can see that the processes do take place in the cytosol of the yeast cell. So it's cool to make a poster like this because it can enable you to see where all of the um, different processes take place, um, see their compartmentation. And of course, we know that this is a eukaryotic cell because we've got our mitochondrial matrix here where eventually much of our action is going to take place. My poster is incomplete right here because I haven't added on some of the details. For example, of course, we remember in step one that ATP is consumed. And again, in step three, we know in our epic pour-off step where catalyzed by phosphofructokinase, ATP is once again consumed for uh, uh, us being in the hole at minus two. And then we've got our splitting of something sweet step, step four, step five, that equilibrium step, step six, finally netting some pay dirt in the form of NADH. And then once we get our 1,3-BPG, remember that that is able to transfer a phosphoryl group onto ADP to make ATP. And in fact, stoichiometry is two here. And now we get two ATPs. We're out of the hole. We've now net zero. But then when we get to this PEP, the wicked high energy phosphoenopyruvate, we see the transfer of a phosphoryl group onto two more ADPs to finally net us that two ATPs and give us the pay dirt that we went in hoping to get. And of course, reducing power N, ATPs, and pyruvate in a ratio of two, two, and two. So this review is super important. Once you have a really nice poster, you'll find it easy to do challenging questions, um, even those questions that are a little bit mathy. Let's try one. This one is very straightforward, but sometimes just seeing the math seems overwhelming to, to people and seeing big numbers. So let's see if we can take this on and, and totally rock it out. So if 3.34 times 10 to the 21 molecules of glucose are oxidized by a culture of bacteria living on a GSA plate, remember that glucose is the source of um, organic carbon in a GSA plate. So glucose will be oxidized in, in pretty large amounts on a GSA. This number of molecules is representative of the kinds of amounts that you would find in a GSA. Um, how many net ATP molecules are harvested via substrate level phosphorylation in the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway only? How much reducing power is created? So this is where we just have to remember our output. Remember that for every time the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway runs, for every glucose it degrades, two ATPs are made. So we just need our trusty conversion factor, two ATP per every one glucose. And hey, you're setting it up right now to cancel some sweet units. So just multiply by the number of molecules of glucose, 3.34 times 10 to the 21 molecules of glucose. And 
excellent. We get to cancel units, it feels so good. And we can get 6.68 times 10 to the 21 ATPs being net. Now it shouldn't be terribly hard to go from there to get the number of NADH molecules because of course we recall that the stoichiometry is the same. There are also two NADHs yielded for every one glucose molecule that is oxidized in the ebdemeyer hoff pathway. So I'll let you finish off the math on that one. We need to now proceed along to talk about an alternative glucose degrading pathway. This pathway is called the pentose phosphate pathway. I kind of like its alternative name, the hexose monophosphate shunt. And I'll show you why I feel like that is a very descriptive name for the pathway. So the hexose monophosphate shunt. In this pathway, I'm going to label it in by both of its names, the panose phosphate pathway or hexose monophosphate path hexose monophosphate shunt. We might also say if you would like to add more parentheses here, that this is another glycolytic pathway. This is a second glycolytic pathway different than the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway. And it's run at different times. Remember that the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway has as its central goal the production of ATP. That ATP can be produced directly by substrate level phosphorylation or indirectly by making high energy reducing power that can go to the ETC. But that is the goal of the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway. The goal of the pentose phosphate pathway is very different. Instead, this pathway has as the goal to support the synthesis, the biosynthesis of, of molecules, that is to support anabolism. So said another way, we might say that the pentose phosphate pathway is run when a cell needs to build stuff. So let me just put an arrow and say this pathway is totally upregulated when a cell needs to build stuff. or said a little bit more sex in a more sexy uh, vernacular, we could say upregulated when a cell needs to build stuff, or AKA when a cell is focused on anabolism. So in a cell that is actively uh, replicating and needs to synthesize a great deal of DNA, that would be a wonderful example of a cell that would upregulate the pentose phosphate pathway. That makes you start to think about the kinds of products that might come from the pentose phosphate pathway. That is products that will support anabolism. For example, remember that the reducing power in the form of NADPH is the type of reducing power that is utilized to provide electrons to anab anabolism, to um, reductive anabolism, right? It brings the reducing power to reductive anabolism. So we better darn guess that the primary product of this pathway is NADPH. And in fact, the entire first stage of the pentose phosphate pathway is just dedicated to making lots of NADPH. The second portion of the pathway is dedicated to synthesizing ribonucleotides, to synthesizing ribonucleotides that is, it is uh, dedicated to making the, the subunit ribose 5-phosphate to enable the synthesis of DNA and RNA. So the second stages will have that as their central goal. Just like glycolysis or the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway, this occurs in the cytoplasmic matrix. It can operate at the same time as the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway so that the cell is both giving off ATP but also the reducing power needed for anabolism. So some molecules of glucose 6-phosphate might go on in the Ebdemeyerhoff pathway, whereas some of them might be, here we got it, shunted off over to the pentose phosphate pathway where they can be utilized to make NADPH. Again, just like glycolysis or Ebdemeyerhoff, this can operate either aerobically or anaerobically. That is, it is completely, um, it, does, it could care less about whether or not oxygen or a terminal electron acceptor is present. It does not rely on that. We're not going to memorize all of the steps of the pentose phosphate pathway. However, you do want to add it onto your poster. Let's look at the broad um, stages of the pathway and hone in on the goal of producing first NADPH.
NADPH is the primary goal of the oxidative stage. And in fact, this molecule is produced in um, oxidation reactions that occur in step one and step three. NADPH is produced um, as the primary product here, and the um, ribulose 5-phosphate might go on into further steps to make ribose 5-phosphate, or if the cell just needs NADPH, the ribulose 5-phosphate can be recycled, and we'll see in a minute how that happens. I thought it might be of interest to um, several of you, uh, Jeff, DJ, um, Trey, all of you might be interested in the fact that the first enzyme that catalyzes this, um, this step, step number one, as you might all guess, is most likely to be a regulated step. Notice a metabolically irreversible step, a step whose enzyme is most likely subject to feedback inhibition, feed forward activation. But it's also really interesting to note that in humans, that if this enzyme is deficient, then the um, cell's ability to keep iron reduced at the active site of the hemoglobin molecule is um, deterred, and that leads to sickle cell. So it's interesting to see the root of that deficiency and the um, cause of that disease. So the oxidative stage has that goal of giving up um, electrons in the form of NADPH. The NADPH can now run off to power anabolic reactions, reductive biosyntheses. If a cell is focused on making DNA or RNA, it will convert this ribulose 5-phosphate into ribose 5-phosphate in the next stage. This is, these are the non-oxidative um, stages of the pathway. And if a cell needs lots of ribose 5-phosphate, making lots of DNA, for example, then the pathway is completed here. However, if a cell needs tons of NADPH, maybe in helping to keep a metal ion reduced like iron, but it doesn't need a lot of ribose 5-phosphate Lagos, um, then in which case it might actually not need ribose 5-phosphate, and instead the um, intermediates such as ribose 5-phosphate will be recycled and converted back into molecules that you will recognize. These molecules are glycolytic intermediates, and you will for sure recognize glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, fructose 6-phosphate being intermediates in glycolysis. So now these can be shunted back into glycolysis. And that's why, again, the hexose monophosphate shunt is a really fitting name for the pentose phosphate pathway because, remember, glucose 6-phosphate is the first intermediate of the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. It's getting shunted over to make NADPH and ribose 5-phosphate, and then it's getting recycled back, and the um, products are getting shunted back into the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. So it's like this, um, it's a detour. <laughs> it's like the hexose monophosphate shunt is a temporary detour in order to make NADPH and um, ribose 5-phosphate. So we could actually look at this on our big picture poster, and I do highly encourage you to add this onto your big picture uh, poster, even if it's not with all of its details. It can be with uh, more or less detail as you see fit. And I'm going to jot it down with slightly less detail just for purposes of fitting it on my poster. So what we would see going on here is that the glucose 6-phosphate gets shunted off into the pentose phosphate pathway, which I'll just call PPP for short, just to fit onto my drawing. And then we know that the two products that might come out of the pentose phosphate pathway will, of course, be lots of reducing power in the form of NADPH, which can take its reducing power to power anabolism, and also ribose 5-phosphate, which we know is a building block in DNA and RNA synthesis, uh, nucleic acid um, biosynthesis. But if that's not needed, then we also know that the uh, intermediates can get siphoned back into glycolysis in the form of fructose 6-phosphate and in the form of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. One question that I commonly get from students is, why wouldn't a cell just run the PPP all the time? I mean, it looks like it makes sense because all of the intermediates of glycolysis enter back in before we get any pay dirt. So why not get the yield that we would get from the pentose phosphate pathway first and then get the yield that we would get from glycolysis? And it's great, it's a great thought. The only issue with that is that for every time a glucose 6 phosphate goes to the PPP, there actually is the loss of a CO2. So if six molecules of glucose 6 phosphate get shunted over here, we actually lose a full molecule of glucose. So there is a price to be paid, even though it seems less obvious, for running the pentose phosphate. So you would only a cell would only want to run the pentose phosphate pathway if it needed NADPH and if it needed ribose 5-phosphate, or if at least it needed one or the other.
So that being said, that is an alternative glycolytic pathway different from the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. And now we only have one more of those pathways to talk about. The final glucose degrading pathway that we're going to talk about is called the etner deuterov pathway. And this pathway is an alternative to glycolysis or Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. Uh, I like to think of it as the two-in-one shampoo because it actually produces products that both the penose phosphate pathway would produce and that the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway would produce. Um, but it is really just an alternative to the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. We see it in mostly in soil bacteria. So um, some of the bacteria that will uh, appealed to Eric with his interest in um, bioremediation, for example, Pseudomonas, Rhizobium, Azotobacter, Agrobacterium, a very big environmental consequence are some of these um, microorganisms. So these are the ones in which the etner deuterov pathway has been most noteworthy and celebrated. They're not actually the only bacteria that run the etner deuterov pathway. There are a few other gram negatives. Um, mostly gram positives don't use this pathway, but there are a few, um, those of you who had unknown number 150 in Terococcus faecalis, that actually is a bacterium that um, I, like to, I like to call it a duck out of water because it's a gram positive that has certain behaviors like a gram negative. And one of those is that it does um, have, utilize the etner deuterov pathway. So again, this is a, a, an alternative glucose de degrading pathway, something that these bacteria have instead of the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. So the steps on this are have fit that two-in-one shampoo idea. That is, the trio stages are identical to those that we see in the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. So you're going to recognize all of those stages where glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is further oxidized, forming pyruvate. You've seen these stages before. So those will, will be recognizable. And then likewise, the hexo stages are very much the same as what we see in the penose phosphate pathway, or at least very similar. So so we're still going to see that um, sort of oxidative nature of the first stage of the penose phosphate pathway making itself known in the first uh, stages of the etner deuterov pathway as well. Let's take a look at this pathway. It's really, uh, it's quite a unique one and very cool. Looking at some of the things that we recognize from the penose phosphate pathway happening first. And in fact, the same enzyme converting glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphogluconate, we didn't name that intermediate in the penose phosphate pathway, but that is the first intermediate in, uh, of the first oxidation in which we get the production of NADPH. So notice that unlike the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway, unlike traditional glycolysis, the etner deuterov pathway does produce NADPH. So this pathway can support a certain amount of need for reductive biosynthesis, uh, producing NADPH where Ebden-Meyerhoff does not. Um, the kind of quintessential or key intermediate in this pathway is 3-keto, 3 3-deoxy, 3 6-phosphogluconate. It's quite a mouthful. And it is split down into the three carbon intermediates. But notice that rather than being split into two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, like we see in glycolysis, it's split into one pyruvate and one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. That means that the stoichiometry on that from here out is one. So note that this pyruvate's all done. So now only one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is oxidized in the steps that you now recognize, getting converted to big old 1,3-BPG, worth its weight in gold, and able to make ATP, 3-phosphoglycerate uh, and 2-phosphoglycerate, and finally our good friend PEP or phosphoenopyruvate. So we see these being the steps that we already know in which NADH is generated, ATP is generated, and ATP is generated again to give a net yield of ATP. So let's see if we can um, challenge our minds to determine the net yield of the etner deuterov pathway because it's definitely different than the Ebden-Meyerhoff pathway. So let's kind of work our way through this, noticing that we get the input of an ATP in step one. That's not unfamiliar because this is the exact same step that we see in glycolysis. So minus one ATP... But here we get in step two, plus one NADPH. That's just not something we saw being produced at all in glycolysis. And then we ramp through these remaining steps, but at a stoichiometry of one for the trio stages, we get plus one NADH. 
And now we're at a net of zero ATP because we've invested one ATP up here and net one here, so we're at zero. And then finally, plus one ATP down here in the final step in which PP gets converted to pyruvate, very recognizable step for us. So notice then, if we were to write the net yield, the overall yield for this pathway, we've got one NADPH, one NADH, and one ATP. For, again, a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one stoichiometry, one NADH, one NADPH, one ATP. And that's the overall net yield of our two-in-one shampoo pathway, um, making all of the types, or making two types of reducing power and ATP at the same time. Uh, most bacteria that have the Edner deuterov pathway also run the pentose phosphate pathway, but they don't run glycolysis. So here's where they're getting their ATP, their NADH, they're getting a, a additional reducing power in the form of NADPH to run biosyntheses. So many soil microbes and some others are going to really love this two-in-one shampoo pathway. I want to make sure that we revisit the fates of pyruvate. So remember that in our canyoneering analogy, we said that once pyruvate is formed, which we know to be the product, whether we're talking about the pentose phosphate pathway, the ebden meyerhoff pathway, or the etner deuterov pathway, our goal now is to say, well, what might happen to that pyruvate? There are many possible things that could occur depending upon what's going on in the cell. So we now get to uh, entertain these many fates of pyruvate, choosing which uh, direction it goes based upon the needs of the cell. So let's begin by uh, thinking about the possibility that uh, pyruvate could, could get further oxidized. So in a yeast cell, as my cartoon shows, that would occur in the mitochondrial matrix. These two pyruvates would go into the matrix where they would be further oxidized, remember forming the two carbon acetyl CoA groups, and also concomitantly producing that thoroughly worn out, fully used up carbon dioxide because there's a carbon lost here going from a three carbon molecule to a two carbon molecule. And also remember that this is a redox reaction where more reducing power is produced. So NAD plus is reduced to NADH. And of course we have a taxi cab uh, cofactor added on here in the form of coenzyme A and we'll talk more about that later. So this is one possible fate of pyruvate, and I'm just going to label this fate number one. But again, it's not the only thing that could happen to pyruvate. And we know certainly that pyruvate provides a lovely three-carbon Lego that could be used to build other things. For example, pyruvate could simply get used as a building block to build the amino acid alanine. This is a good example of the use of pyruvate as a precursor metabolite. So fate number two, I'm going to draw in here that this is two indicates that pyruvate could be used as a precursor metabolite or a Lego to build bigger things. The third possible fate of pyruvate comes along when the possibility of further oxidation is gone. And remember how we talked about that before. For example, with yeast, <laughs> when we put the stopper in the bottle and we starve the yeast of oxygen, their terminal electron acceptor, we basically say, hey, you can't use your ETC anymore. The TCA stops. All of the jazz happening in the mitochondrial matrix comes to a screeching halt. And the only possibility is that pyruvate could get used itself as a, an electron acceptor. So pyruvate or a derivative of pyruvate can get used to just simply recycle the NADH that's made in step six of glycolysis. And that enables glycolysis to keep on running. Remember this, this fate that I'm describing three is the use of pyruvate or a derivative of pyruvate in fermentation. So this is fermentation. Of course, we know that within a yeast cell, that fermentation is totes gonna be alcoholic, right? So our product of this kind of fermentation 
is going to be ethanol. And we're going to talk a little bit more very quickly here about this third possible fate. So reminding ourselves of these three possible fates for pyruvate, beginning with the idea of further oxidation, that pyruvate gets ripped and stripped further of its high energy electrons in the transition step and the TCA cycle, and the electrons, the reducing power formed, goes to the ETC and makes more ATP, right? That's the high energetic, super amazing yield uh, fate of pyruvate. But we know too, pyruvate could get used as a precursor metabolite, the Lego to build other molecules. And then, of course, remember that our third and maybe um, our most favorite, depending upon the day, fate of pyruvate is the use of um, it or a derivative of it as a, an acceptor in fermentation. So this allows for the production of these incredibly useful products such as, uh, you know, the uh, fermented sourdough bread, uh, yogurt, uh, sour cream, buttermilk, um, beer, wine, and other alcoholic beverages. So all of these amazing products that we often celebrate um, will see being a product of this fate of pyruvate. Welcome back to my home where it's the perfect place to talk about the types of fermentation. And I'd like to begin by looking at alcoholic fermentation. About a year ago with my student athletes, we made a spiced blackberry wine. And you can see that wine right here. Um, of course, it has been fermenting and then aging for a time. But I want to show you how we went about doing that and what the yeast in here are doing. So we added, of course, blackberry juice and apple juice and spice spices and of course the wine yeast and a lot of sugar. So here's the wine yeast that we added. Um, it comes in a packet and you will first um, put it in with some of this must, which is the juices and sugars, and you allow it to grow aerobically for a little while, meaning that it has access to a terminal electron acceptor oxygen, and it can run its ETC and make lots of ATP that way via oxidative phosphorylation. However, we then put a stopper in the top of the bottle. So we poured it into this bottle, this carboy, and then we um, put the airlock on top. So this is an airlock, and you can see how this airlock allows um, gases to escape, but it doesn't allow any terminal electron acceptor to enter. So oxygen isn't capable of getting in to this anymore. And so, of course, then the yeast have no place to send their NADH. So their NADH has no possible home. So that's when the yeast spring into action um, doing alcoholic fermentation. And what that means is that pyruvate or a derivative of pyruvate begins to serve as an internal electron acceptor because there's no access to the external electron acceptor. And so in the case of alcoholic fermentation, the pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde. Um, and when that conversion takes place, there's a decarboxylation, right? A popping off of CO2. So the CO2 bubbles out. And in fact, this gets very bubbly and this bubbles around because that CO2 is escaping. But then that acetaldehyde, it serves as an internal trapped electron acceptor for the NADH made in glycolysis. That enables the NADH to get oxidized and to become NAD plus again. And that enables glycolysis to keep on going and to keep on making its whopping 2 ATP. So that's the only way that the yeast can let. It's sometimes tempting for us to think that yeast do uh, alcoholic fermentation in order to make this wonderful byproduct of ethanol. Um, you know, they just want to get drunk, right? But that's not the case. In fact, they're doing that to keep on running their glycolysis. Um, and Gabby loves the making of wine too. Um, they want to keep making ATP via that pathway. They want to be able to continue to generate energy. And that's why they do this, is or in order to regenerate NAD plus so that they can keep running glycolysis in this environment that is lacking a, an externally derived electron acceptor. So alcoholic fermentation um, is, is one type of fermentation, but we have other types as well. And I have those too. So one of my favorite treats is kimchi. Kimchi is another fermented um, part of really 
a really important part of a nutritious diet because, of course, in kimchi, you got lactic acid bacteria, or the lab for short. The lactic acid bacteria, they utilize fermentation to live as well. Now, unlike yeast that have the option of running an electron transport chain and generating a lot of energy via oxidative phosphorylation, the lactic acid bacteria don't even have an electron transport chain. So the lactic acid bacteria that always have to regenerate their NADH, they always have to reoxidize it, and they're even a little quicker about it because rather than creating acetaldehyde as a di derivative of pyruvate first, instead they produce simply lactic acid. So um, with the production of lactic acid from pyruvate, it just simply means that NADH is putting its electrons directly on to pyruvate instead of a derivative of pyruvate. So pyruvate gets directly reduced. It serves as the direct internal acceptor of electrons, and that produces lactic acid. Now, depending upon the organism, um, of course, we do lactic acid too. We make lactic acid as a byproduct of our aerobic uh, fermentation as well. But depending upon the organism, and there's a mixture here within kimchi, some organisms will be um, heterolactic fermenters, some will be homolactic fermenters. Of course, homolactic fermenters make only lactic acid, whereas heterolactic fermenters make a mixture. And we can sometimes see, and in fact, there are certain bacteria that make mo both alcohol as a fermentation byproduct and lactic acid. They're, of course, heterolactic because they're making two different products or mixed products of fermentation. Now, no matter the kind of fermentation, the goal of the organism is to regenerate NAD+. They need to because if they don't, they can't keep running glycolysis, right? That step in glycolysis 6 in which NADH is generated, if there was just ever generating NADH, it would come to a screeching halt. And so in order to keep that step going and keep glycolysis going, the regeneration of NAD+, is essential. Now I have my other and my favorite. This is actually my homemade kombucha that I've just put into a Synergy bottle. Um, this came from my awesome um, SCOBY Pele, the one that, um, that came from Hawaii. And so this kombucha utilizes a mixture of fermentation as well. Um, however, one of the primary members of this is acetobacter. So it produces acetic acid as a byproduct of its fermentation, and it's utilizing acetic acid fermentation to regenerate its NAD+. No matter the type of fermentation, and there are lots of them, you'll talk about even more in lab, um, that... It's the goal of all of them is to regenerate NAD+. Uh, alcoholic fermentation, where pyruvate is converted to acetaldehyde and then to ethanol, of course, with the goal of regenerating the NAD+. Pyruvate converted to lactate in lactic acid fermentation, same goal. But there's also uh, propionic bacteria. Propion propionate as the fo uh, uh, formation of the product, the acidic byproduct um, that propionobacteria will make. Um, so in fact, if you like Swiss cheese, and I don't know any anyone else is like me, uh, older at an older age, I started craving Swiss cheese. Um, I didn't like it when I was younger, so kind of an acquired taste. Uh, the Swiss cheese is made with propionic acid fermentation. Uh, now, certain bacteria that we work with in lab, um, such as E. coli, can utilize what's called mixed acid fermentation. So certain of our enterobacteriaceae, enteric bacteria, will use that fermentation, making a lot of different um, mixed acid um, and or alcohols um, and things like that. 2,3-butendiol is another possible product for other kinds of enterobacteriaceae. Uh, for example, enterobacter and Klebsiella will make that as a byproduct of their fermentation. So sometimes which kind of fermentation is used by an organism is helps, uh, helps us to identify that bacteria. Uh, so all the fermentations, many different fermentations, and yet the goal is always the regeneration of NAD plus to keep glycolysis kicking and moving.